Welcome back to Biomechanics Lab. This is going to be our second pre-lab lecture over chapter one. This is going to concern bones. In the previous lecture, when I went over parts of the body and planes of motion, I had a slide that had the various, uh, it was a table that contained the common names for, you know, different parts of the body. For example, I mentioned that the common name, we talk about eyes, but the specific scientific name is the orbital region, or ribs is a common name, the scientific name would be the costal region, things like that, okay? Um, we also have a, a, t a picture like this that has a lot of the really important bones, okay? Now, right now, you don't need to have all of these memorized, because what we're going to do is... In this class, once we get past week three, we're going to take an in, de an in detail look at the various regions of the body. We'll become familiar with those as we progress through the first uh, nine weeks or so. So, for example, we're going to look at the knee joint. Okay, that's one of the regions we're going to look in detail about. We're going to have a whole week over that. So, for example, we'll probably be familiar after that week with the femur. We'll look at the patella, the fibula, the tibia, tibial tuberosity, fibula head so on and so forth, okay? We'll have another week where we look at, excuse me, the hip joint, and we'll look at the bones there, um, the shoulder joint, etc. So don't really worry so much about this right now. What we want to do is, is get more familiar with some of the other facets of bones, not memorizing their names. All right, so we have several types of bones here. First of all, we have what are called long bones, and their name is exactly um, what they imply. They're longer than they are wide. Um, so great examples of this would be the femur. So this is the femur. It's the, um, that's the, we'll do some terminology, it's the proximal bone in the leg. And if we think about what's more distal, we would have the fibula and the tibia. Okay. Um, in the arms, this is the this would be the uh, more distal part of the arm. This is the forearm. We would have the radius and the ulna. If we went more to the uh, proximal part, we'd have the humerus, and then distal to these bones would be the uh, the hand bones. Okay, so the carpals, etc., metacarpals. But the point is, long bones are longer than they are wide. Short bones are the opposite. They're about as long as they are wide. And you can obviously see there's some error in that, but they're certainly not super long, okay? They're approximately as long as they are wide, okay? That doesn't mean it's perfect. And we're typically going to find short bones in areas where we're going to have some gliding motions, okay? So for example, if we look at carpal bones, we're typically going to find a lot of short bones in areas where we don't have a huge range of motion where we need more, say, stability. They're more stable joints. Long bones um, are going to be associated with joints where there's usually, usually much more mobility, but that tends to cause a decrease in the stability of the joint. So for example, uh, we would find the carpal bones. Those would be in the hands, metacarpal bones, uh, similar to that. Okay, And flat bones are just flat. And two great examples, we have the sternum, which if we go to this picture, the sternum is this bone in the front right here that actually plays a role in protecting um, some of the organs in the mediastinal cavity right here, so like the heart. And we also have the scapula, which you can see is this region particularly right here is very flat. Scapula is on the back side. There's a left and right scapula, and those are going to give some protection from the back side. So protection also to the mediastinal cavity and also more so to the lungs also, okay? And the flat bones, a lot of what they're going to do is provide protection. So when we're looking at long bones, they're going to be more associated with large movements. Short bones help with movements, but they're less movement, but more stability. Flat bones are going to have a protective measure, okay? Now, irregular bones, um, we have this concept in, in physiology that the structure of something dictates or provides its function. There's this no, uh, no exception here. Irregular bones really have no shape that really fits in with any of these other groups. However, the structure of the bone uh, plays a role in its function. So for example, an irregular bone would be the vertebral bones. And these vertebral bones stack on top of each other, and they have a little bit of um, bending or um, joint capacity, but they're going to allow you to move your spine. Okay, they stack on top of each other, and that also provides some stability. The fact that these are flat, you can fit another one on top, and another one on top of that, etc., up and down the spine. Okay. Another one is going to be the sphenoid bone. 
Okay, you can see here that it has no really no shape that really fits in with any of these other ones. Okay, then we also have sesamoid bones. Sesamoid bones generally are going to provide a smooth surface for um, other bones to rub against. So, for example, this is the patella right here. You can see that. Here's the anterior view. So that's when, when a doctor hits you on the knee with a hammer. They're more or less hitting the anterior side. And the posterior patella is going to have these pockets in here, which are going to provide some insertion points for the other bones of the leg that are going to allow them to sort of glide over the patella um, without um, having a lot of friction because there's a lot of um, protective uh, layers here, such as articular cartilage and other fluids. Okay. We also have ses a sesamoid bone called the great toe sesamoid in the foot, okay? All right, so what we can do is we can look at the components of a bone. So if we look at the proximal end of a long bone and the distal end, those regions are called epiphyses, and the singular would be epiphysis, okay? Um, if we look at the shaft part of the long bone, so between the two epiphyses, that's called the diaphysis, okay? Um, when I look at the epiphyses, um, they're going to have usually a lot of trabecular or cancellous bone. And cancellous bone is going to be much more porous than the other types of bone, which we'll see more in the uh, diaphysis called cortical bone. But cancellous bone slash trabecular bone, those are the same things, um, they have, they have, they're the kind of bones that have these little pores or holes. They're not as dense with bone material. And like I said, you're going to find those more in the epiphyses of the bone. In the diaphysis, where you need much more resilience, you have cortical bone, which is much, much more dense, but much less porous than a cancellous bone that is in the epiphyses. And also in the diaphysis, we have a medullary cavity. And that medullary cavity has blood vessels in it that provide nutrients to the various parts of the bone. Remember that bone cells are not metabolically inactive as they might be portrayed to be. Okay, And if we also kind of think about the layers of the bone, we also have the endosteum. The endosteum is the layer that coats the inside of the bone facing the medullary cavity. And then the periosteum is the outside, sort of a wrapping around the bone itself. Okay, we also have yellow marrow and we also have, we're also going to have red bone marrow. The red bone marrow is going to be more in this area right here. And the red bone marrow is going to be the site of blood cell synthesis. Okay, so when somebody gets a bone marrow transplant, they actually have to drill out, or I should say drill into the bone. And that's why a bone marrow transplant hurts so much. They actually have to get in here to get the red bone marrow out. Okay. And this is an x-ray of, of this person. It looks like their left hand. Okay, you can see the diaphysis right here. You can also see the epiphysis of this bone. It's right here. And then there's an epiphyseal plate. Okay, the epiphyseal plate we're going to look at on the next couple of slides. Now, we have this concept that bones grow in length. And they grow in length up to a certain point. Usually we call that puberty. Um, when puberty ends, um, they're as long as they're going to get usually. Okay? Because as we know, when we're a baby, our arms and legs are pretty short. right? And then they grow in length, obviously, to our adult forms. Well, the way that they're going to grow in their, to our ad adult lengths is we have something called an epiphyseal plate. This is either called the growth plate, or sometimes the full name is epiphyseal growth plate. And it's made of cartilage specifically hyaline cartilage. And this hyaline cartilage, up until the end of puberty, this cartilage continues to replenish itself. So we have more and more cartilage there. But what happens is, is over the course of growth from a baby up until the end of puberty, we have some of that cartilage is turned into bone. But if we have continuously regenerating cartilage, and some of that cartilage is turned into bone, the bone's going to grow in length because we're adding more and more bone. Now, eventually, we're going to get to a point, which it turns out to be around the time of end of puberty, when um, we have signals from other um, hormones such as testosterones and estrogens. Uh, the cartilage is going to solidify all into bone. And at that point, we say that there are remnants of the epiphyseal plates, or we say that the plates have sealed. So if, if you were asked what, was, what structure in the long bone is responsible for its growth in length, 
you would say the epiphyseal growth plate. Okay, and just keep in mind the center of the bone, which initially isn't there, we start getting hollowed out and it becomes a medullary cavity with blood vessels. It's rich in blood vessels to provide nutrients to all the cells of the bone. Okay, and this is just another uh, look at this. We can have growth in diameter of the bone. That's more responsible for, I mean, we do have growth in in the diameter as we get older, um, as we get bigger and bigger to our adult size, but also when we have growth in diameter, that can be due to injuries to the bone. For example, if I fracture a bone, growth in diameter is going to be the type that heals it. Okay, Growth in length really doesn't do anything like that. It just increases the length of our bones and it goes up until approximately the end of puberty. Okay. Um, also take note of this, the bone, this is the cancellous bone or trabecular bone. You can see very well in this picture that it's very porous, not as dense. Then if you go down the diaphysis, this is the cortical bone. It's more dense, but less porous. And here you can see the epiphyseal line right here. Okay. Also on the ends of long bones at the epiphyses, we have a layer of hyaline cartilage called articular cartilage. And its function is to provide some uh, a surface that bones can rub up against each other on that won't cause pain. Because if we had the, just the two plain ends of the bones rubbing against each other, that would hurt a lot because there'd be a lot of friction. Having this articular cartilage there prevents that friction from uh, being created. In fact, there's a disease state where you have degeneration of this articular cartilage. It's called osteoarthritis. And in osteoarthritis, by some metric, the articular cartilage has, de has been degenerated, and so you have bones rubbing against bones. And if that happens in the hip, say, um, then you would probably have a hip replacement, and you can have the same thing in the knee. All right, so hopefully you got something out of this lecture, and um, we will go to joints in the next lecture. Thank you.